Hi again. Uh, so today I want to wrap up our study of Merleau-Ponty's Eye and Mind, and with that uh, bring to a close this introduction to continental philosophy that we've been doing. Uh, and to do that, I want to, to get you to start by going back to the very beginning and just trying to remember what phenomenology is. Right? Phenomenology is the description of experience as it is lived. And that project that we began with way back when we started reading Being in Time is, of course, very much the thing that we came to last time when I was talking about eye and mind in relationship to Derrida and this idea of uh, trying to look at our experience with fresh eyes and to uh, uh, recognize its character prior to or outside of the familiar kind of categorization that comes with our received ways of talking about things, understanding things, and so on. And so we're not just going to rely on the way, as we might say, our experience has already been written or inscribed. Uh, we're trying to get back in our thinking, I suppose, to that moment of inscribing. And that's what we now want to think about uh, what, as we're thinking about the nature of art. Right? I, I was saying last time that, uh, that you know, art can serve many purposes. You, know, you might like looking at it. It's pleasant and it's entertaining. Um, it decorates your room. You know, there are all kinds of things you can do with art. Make a political statement. All that stuff is important, but uh, but uh, Merleau-Ponty's and Heidegger's uh, claim is that the the real founding meaning of art, its distinctive reality as a thing that human beings do, is that it is that moment of inscribing, that moment of um, inaugurating a kind of grasp on our experience, and in that sense. Um, making it possible for us to have terms for making sense of our experience. Um, that's art in general. Uh, Merleau-Ponty's essay is going to then focus especially on the, on the nature of painting. Uh, so uh, it, so it's, gonna, it's still going to make the same kind of point about painting, but he's just going to look at what, what specifically painting uh, contributes, and you'll see why in a minute. Um, but, but I want you just to think a little bit about that, about painting versus the other arts, right? You can think of you know, something like sculpture uh, presents you, you know, really bodies in the world. They're, they're, uh, it's a body in the world you can relate to as a body, you can walk around it, you can feel it, and so on. Uh, um, whereas painting offers something quite different, right? Painting is just a, a two-dimensional surface with pigment on it. Uh, and yet, the, in that painting, to, to think, you know, of, of painting in the familiar sense. Not, I'm not so much thinking of... Um, you know, Jackson Pollock's uh, action paintings, although, you know, we might eventually get to that. I talk about that in Sites of Exposure a bit. Um, but I'm thinking, you know, your average painting, you know, of a landscape or something like that, right? The thing about painting is it, it hands you a world, uh, uh, you know, and, and it's a world in space. There are bodies and there is space and there's stuff happening. But the amazing thing is that that's happening uh, on a two-dimensional surface with pigment. So in that way, if you compare painting and sculpture, painting has given you that world of bodies in space, which is what sculpture would do as well, but it's taken away the bodies. So painting, in a way, uh, has, as its chosen way of working, to present appearance as appearance. Right? It's, it's taken the substance of things away, and it's just giving you a kind of appearing. And so in that way, painting really speaks quite just just in its medium it speaks quite powerfully of our uh, existence as Dasein to use Heidegger's language right we are experiencing beings experiencing is what it's like is what it's about experiencing is what we are experiencing is what's happening and experience is an appearing of something to someone right? and so appearing is is our is our domain, right? And that's why we were doing phenomenology. We were doing a logi, an account of the phenomenon, of the appearing. So painting works at the level of appearing. It is appearing portrayed as appearing. Uh, and so, so that, and, and that's really what Merleau-Ponty is going to try to get at here. He says, you know, painting is, is really f uh, focusing exclusively on the visible, right? It's, it's focusing on uh, not things in their um, bodily substantiality, but in the way a world is able to appear to us, 
the way a world is seen by us. Um, uh, now, you, you know, you might say, well, why, why visible? Why not just sensible or something like that? Well, there are other senses. It's hearing, taste, smell, touch. But I think the thing with, if, uh, uh, with um, touch and taste and smell is those things um, seem to work much more by a kind of immediate contact, right? You touch the thing and you hold it. Right? There's, you know, there's still a medium of the skin and whatever else, but, but there's a way that touch is really about a body contacting a body. Similarly with taste. The smell is a, a little more ambiguous, but, but it still seems like it, it, it like, like uh, touch and taste, is, is very much about a kind of directness of contact. Whereas sight and hearing are so much more about grasping something that's away, something that's at a distance. So um, sight and hearing, which correspond basically to the arts of painting and music, offer a different uh, route into our experience of the world, our experience of bodies, and they, and, uh, compared to the other senses. And they particularly emphasize that fact that we experience things at a distance. But now let's just think about painting and music for a second. Uh, both of them, in a way, give you the world, but without its substantial presence, as you would get in sculpture. But painting, uh, but whereas painting really, in a way, seems to give you the object, music much more uh, gives you something like the mood or the feeling of it, right? You, m music uh, happens in you. It's in your hearing and in your feeling that the music really comes to life. And so you feel what it's like to be in a certain kind of setting and so on. But it is, it is that character of it that is mostly, maybe even exclusively, uh, communicated to you or brought to life in you. Whereas painting more like sculpture, still gives you the bodies in space, still gives you the world. So painting is in this very interesting position that it's, it's, it's kind of an art of subjectivity in a way that sculpture isn't exactly, in as much as sculpture gives you an object, whereas painting is sort of about appearing. But it's also the objective side of subjectivity, right? It's about how objects come to appear to you rather than music, which is more about the subjective side of subjectivity. It's more about uh, the feeling, right? So that's a quick, just a quick sketch of um, the expressive potential of these different media of art. And uh, I'm hoping that in saying that, uh, it's just got a kind of prima facie plausibility to you. So Merleau-Ponty is, is operating uh, with you know, in that basic framework for for just try, trying to think about how this very medium uh, has a distinctive thing it's able to express. Uh, now, uh, broadly, I, you know, I've been talking about appearing in sites of exposure. I've tried to talk about things that I think are quite similar to the sorts of things Merleau Ponty is talking about here. I haven't narrowed it down to painting and vision, though. I have tried to talk about the arts more generally, and consequently, I've talked about appearing. And I've tried to talk about how appearing, sorry, how art is essentially making appearing appear. Whereas Merle Ponty is going to say that painting is really making vision visible. Uh, so I, I think you can read uh, these two uh, in parallel, the things I say in Sites of Exposure and the things uh, Merle Ponty says in Eye and Mind. And uh, I think you will, you know, see that difference I've just talked about. But I also think that you will find that the stuff I talk about in, in, in those other pages uh, will resonate quite directly with the things he says here, and I hope help to illuminate it. So I'll make a few passing re references to my text, uh, but I'm not going to talk about it in detail because I really want to just stick to a, a, a few core issues related to I and Mind. Anyway, so, so. Um, you know, phenomenology says we need to go back and look at experience. And so Merleau-Ponty says, okay, let's think about what happens in vision. That's what painting is gonna, gonna do. So, you know, what is vision? What is it to see? Well, the, uh, this essay I in mind has five sections. Uh, the third section is focused on Descartes' study of optics. And, uh, 
and I, I, I mentioned that a little bit last time. Uh, I'm not going to talk about it in detail. It's quite a rich uh, and interesting section, but I'm going to breeze over it because I really just want to get on to a few issues about art and painting and so on. Uh, but, but so basically, um, the, the thing he, he looks at there is, in, in looking at Descartes, is, is you know, what, what would you have to say about vision? Or what would you be, um, what would you be led to say about vision? if you started off with the view that the world is an alien object and you are a detached mind, right? And you're saying, okay, what is it that's happening in vision? And, um, you know, he's, he's ultimately critical of that. I talked about some of that last time. Uh, and I'm, I'm not going to go th through the details of that sort of criticism. That, that's, that thing is much more fully worked out in his um, major work, The Phenomenology of Perception, a really rich and great work and he actually says an awful lot that's very powerful in this essay too but i don't i don't really want to get into the details of that i want more just to get you to grasp the sort of overall thrust of the thing he's going to say and uh the basic point he's going to make is that if everything is is radically separated into what is a subject and what is an object uh you know and the subject is a thing that sort of represents and judges and the object is something alien he says, you know, you're gonna you're gonna be basically understanding everything as a kind of gathering of alienated, kind of meaningless, intrinsically meaningless evidence that a that a judging mind sort of operates on and constructs a theory about. And so he tries to show that that's essentially what's happening in the account of vision that you're going to get from Descartes. And so so the so what is the big question about Vision, well, the bizarre, the bizarre thing, and it's the point I already made, is that vision gives you something at a distance. That's, that should strike you as just unbelievable. Um, you know, so taste and touch and smell, those things, you know, as I was saying, seem to have, seem to have, they're more complex too when, it, when you really get down to it. But just on the face of it, you can think, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm just touching something. But the bizarre thing about seeing is you see that thing over there. And the bizarre thing about hearing is like, I just heard a car go down the street, and I bet you heard it on the recording too. Uh, you know, I hear it over there. Uh, and that notion of over there is part of the visual or the auditory meaning. So Merleau-Ponty's point is that, in fact, that is not a judgment. That's, that's a part of the perceptual form. That's his phenomenological claim, and we'll come back to that. But the, that is, and, 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 Again, you should notice that and be struck by how unbelievable that is. How can it be the case that you're a little body over here and somehow the world appears to you? That's, that is unbelievable. Appearing happens. It just it seems crazy. And, and the world that's presented to you is in fact infinite like you only ever see a part of it at a time but you see it as going on beyond what you actually see right the very form your experience takes is you recognize yourself you take yourself to be having a finite presentation of something infinite it's, it's, and it's just it's unbelievable um so really you should pause and try to notice that and reflect on the wonder of it. Uh, and in a way, that's what we're going to get back to. That's what painting is going to end up bringing us back to, is the wonder of that fact of having something at a distance. Uh, but before we get into that, let's stick with the Descartes for a second. So the point is, that's the thing that has to be interpreted. And so all you would have on that uh, dualism of subject and object that I was saying. Well, all you would have on that sort of theory is these kind of immediately present data and a judging mind. And so the question is, how do you get distance out of that? And you know, in in um, in art uh, theory of roughly the same time as Descartes, um, uh, Alberti is famous for having developed this uh, system of perspective. Right? It's you know how. Uh, if you're going to try to draw a picture, how you make it look like things are far away, right? It's this mathematical way of um, 
using a two-dimensional surface to present something three-dimensional. And, and that's roughly, that, the kind of thing that Alberti is trying to put on display there is roughly the sort of thing that Descartes is talking about. So Descartes is basically talking about how uh, you conclude when this and this is the case that, oh, that thing is farther away from this other thing. So Descartes' uh, uh, analysis of optics basically ends up positing that that distance is something you conclude from some kind of uh, construal of the relationship between these elements, or these uh, immediately present bits of evidence. Um, and Merleau-Ponty, uh, the, the, the core of Merleau-Ponty's critique of that, challenge of that, uh, is that if you didn't already have an experience of what distance is, it would never even occur to you to pose that question. Right? That, that the, the, the whole uh, experience of distance that Descartes is trying to explain has to already be there for there ever even to be a reason to try to explain it. Right? And something similar would be true of that point about Alberti, right? These, these De Descartes and Alberti are uh, basically trying to show you how you can do something, but what they're really doing is mapping out a set of relationships that that are available only because there is already an experience of depth, distance happening, and and so what they're portraying as a cause is actually an effect. Right? These, these things aren't what give rise to the experience of distance. It's rather because you have an experience of distance that these things can be deployed in this way. Uh, these are more things you can observe and conclude from an experience of depth as the primary premise rather than the resources you use to get an experience of depth as a conclusion. Uh, that's roughly the... Uh, roughly the, the form his argument takes and you can go through it in more detail if you want and, and it's you know it's a great argument it's a rich and important piece of work um, but I'm hoping that what I've said there by itself is is enough uh, for you to hold on to so that you can see the point and the sense of it and 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 work with it that and the point is if you didn't already have an experience of depth you you could never ask the question where does depth come from? You already have to have that meaning going for you. And that meaning isn't an idea in your mind. That meaning is the living experience of having something at a distance. He's now, and we're now, going to take that as a thing to be explored. What is this experience of depth, which is in a way definitive of the fact of vision? Right? And we're going to take vision to be this thing that in a way we don't understand and never will understand, which is the way that things present themselves to us to see from a distance. Um, so yeah, it happens because you have an eye. As, uh, you know, if you didn't have it, you wouldn't see it. But it's not a mechanic. It's not a matter of mechanics. Uh, it's, uh, it's something quite marvelous about the nature of bodies. And one of the things then that Merleau-Ponty really wants to talk about here is, uh, you'll, you'll see many, many things in the essay about this. Like it's, he's saying this is, what you're seeing is something about the weird fabric of reality, that things can appear to other things. That, you know, I'm looking over there, that piano can appear to this organism, to, to these optic things, right? How is that possible? Well, it's possible because of something about the nature of being. It's possible because of something about the nature of reality, about the nature of bodies. Um, and, that, and that's just given. It's not going to turn out to be wrong. We have that experience all the time. Right? It's not something we made. It's not something we invent. And, it's, and it's, its occurring doesn't depend on our understanding it. And I imagine we're never going to understand it. But that's the nature of the real that there is appearing. The real appears. And there are some other real things, us, but also dogs and cats, to which reality appears. It appears to us in a different way than it appears to the dog and cat. But the, but the thing is, uh, throughout the natural world, the appearing of things to things is happening. And it's essential. Like There would be no animal life if there weren't 
things appearing. You know, dogs have to see what's happening. Cats have to have to see what's happening. They hear things, right? That in all of those ways, um, reality is showing itself to another part of reality. And in us, that happens in a particularly deep and profound way, especially because we can pose on its own terms that question, what is the real? What is it to be? And we talked about that a little bit when we did Being in Time. Um, and that pres presumably is something the cat and the dog don't do. Um, so, th so reality is able to appear to us as reality. And th so it, it's reality appears to us, uh, in a sense, more on its own terms than it can appear to anything else. But in all of those contexts, the real is appearing to other thing, other real things. And that's that is the bizarre mystery, and that's the thing Merleau Ponty is really trying to get you to to sink into. And in all when he's talking about the way that you know the body is part of the world, and there things are sort of uh, there's a kind of reflection between things and so on. Anyway, that's the mystery now that we're going to explore. As I said, presumably we're not going to understand it. We're going to note it, and we're going to explore it. Is, it's going to remain in a certain way a mystery. But anyway, that's what that's what um, he says painting is going to do. One, on 168, he says, in painting, we have a figured philosophy of vision or something, something to that effect. So painting, in other words, you, you could, well, you could say painting is a philosophy of vision. But it's a philosophy of vision not in the form of concepts and theoretical statements, but in the form of figures, in the form of little visions, right? Each painting is a kind of little vision. So he says that's the, the, the weird and remarkable thing that, that painting does, right? The painter sees and the painter tries to render seeing visible by, by making something visible. So it's not a concept, it's a concept-less vision of vision. It's a figure of vision. And through the history of painting, and he's talking about, you know, the world transformative acts of painting, uh, through that history of painting, through the history of those figures, you're getting a, a kind of history of, you might say, the interpretation of painting or the insight into or sorry, of vision or the insight into vision, in that sense, philosophy. So it's a figured philosophy of vision. Um, so that's a little bit about what we want to talk about then. And that, and, uh, he doesn't attempt here to give you, you know, a scientific, uh, a sort of systematic account of the whole history of uh, vision, of painting. I'm not going to do that either. You, you would get something more in that direction in Hegel's aesthetics, Hegel's philosophy of art. Uh, but he doesn't really do that here. I'm not going to do that here. You, uh, not, not, you know, full history, not fully systematic. Though if you do look at the account I give in Sites of Exposure, you will see that I have tried to kind of move step by step through... A, in his terms, a kind of figured philosophy of appearing or of experience, not not specifically vision. Um, but you you can start to look at how, if you read that, you can start to think about how you could be somewhat systematic in thinking about the relationships of different developments in the history of art or the history of painting. Uh, but but so that's that's in a way a kind of promise he's giving you here, but he's not really cashing that out. But you could think about it, uh, or you could start to pursue it if you looked a little bit at sites of exposure. So so he's gonna, so he says well, let, let's let's think a little bit then about how painting puts the appearing that's happening in vision on display. Uh, so I want to just look at a couple of things here. This is a the, a very famous painting uh, painting by Hans Holbein the Younger of Sir Thomas More from uh, 1526. And you know Holbein is uh, regarded as one of the, you know, revolutionarily great portrait painters and so on. Um, there'd be lots to say about this, but I want you to notice only one thing specifically. I want you to look at the sleeves on the thing he's wearing, There's red velvet. The thing that's that I think is very noticeable there, especially if you saw, you know, the real thing or if you saw a very good quality reproduction, is it, it, it looks like velvet and in looking like velvet, it basically looks like it feels a certain way. In other words, the, the very part of the very meaning of the visual experience is that it has a kind of tactile sense. And what I'm, I'm trying to say there is something that brings us back to, to what I talked about last time about the, 
non-separability of vision and motion. You know, I was trying to say there that uh, with Merleau-Ponty, that these aren't radically different senses, but that vision already has a motor sense and emotion already has a sort of visual uh, aspect. And I'm trying to make the same point here with vision and touch, right? What, one of the things that this painting puts on display is that the tactile is not alien to the visual, right? You see how things feel, or how they would feel. Uh, let me pull out another example. This is a painting by uh, Raphael from 1507, pretty much the same time, uh, people carrying the dead Jesus. And you can see that he's heavy. That's another, uh, I guess you'd call it tactile. It's, it's something that's related to the sense of touch. The, the weight is, is meaningfully put on display in that. You, you wouldn't normally think of heavy as one of the things available to vision. You wouldn't think that if you were operating with Descartes or with Alberti as your, as your models. But experientially, heaviness is seen. And that's one of the things that, that um, Raphael is able to demonstrate through his painting. So in those two, in those two uh, paintings from the 1500s, the one by Hans Holbein and the one by Raphael, uh, they are in a way showing you something about vision that that in a sig significant way um, supersedes the theses about vision being made by you know one of the great philosophers 100 years later the thing then to notice about um, our vision is that as i said you see things at a distance and you, but, but you also see things and you see feeling and you know touch and you see weight you see so much you see a whole world like this is the amazing thing about vision that through vision reality not not just uh what you might think of as the particular sensory qualities that the eye can pick up right reality is shown to you through vision you see the real things and in fact let's just go back to this one because if you look at that Raphael picture again, there you really can get this point about uh, the perception of distance, right? Obviously, these are some people standing in front of other people who are uh, on um, a little field that go, uh, carries on way in the distance, and there are mountains back there, and there's sky, and it would just keep on going and going and going. Right? There's an amazing portrayal of the, the depth of the world handed to you here. Uh, and that is immediately that's immediately available to you visually and it's immediately avail available to you through the painting so this painting in a way is showing you how in vision you get depth bodies feeling uh so much and you know we could add more you could get something about the subjectivity of people i mean these people these people are a little bit statuesque uh, there are other ways to portray people, as we'll see uh, shortly, but you nonetheless see feeling in the in the uh, in the faces of these people and in their attitude towards uh, the dead Jesus, basically. Um, actually, let me give you a, just a quick look at a very different image that is, uh, I think, kind of the opposite of statuesque. This is a, a drawing by um, Matisse of a bather with long hair from 1942. Um, and uh, I'll come back and say something about it a bit later, but I just want you to notice that things can be portrayed in ways that don't automatically look like you're looking at a piece of carved stone, which which is a, you know an overstatement for the for the Raphael. But there's there's something kind of true about that, right? These look a little bit more like works of sculpture. Uh, anyway, uh, so the the point I wanted to get out of just looking at those two works from the 1500s, which is you know one of the great ages of painting, probably the great age of painting. And why do I say that? What, what I mean by that is, I don't, I, don't, I don't mean to denigrate any other painters, I mean that was the time in world history when painting kind of came on the scene as the art that the most avant-garde artistic and whatever other kind of culture was exploring and you know in, in a way that had never happened before, right? Paint as a medium became the thing to use and and uh, um, artistic practice was revolutionized right and and 
part of the reason that that may well have happened there going back to the thing i was saying at the beginning is you know that's 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 also the time in general that um the kind of emerging culture of subjectivity was kind of taking over uh history right that that is the time of the scientific revolution and the the all those other things we talked about uh capitalism democracy and so on uh all these different ways in which individuals as subjects were becoming the center of the interpretation of what humanity is. And so that focus on individual subjectivity corresponds to the emergence of painting, which I was earlier saying is a kind of art of subjectivity. Those things correspond to the emergence of painting as this revolutionary new art form. So people have gone on to paint since then, of course, and unbelievable painters. But but I think of this as the great age of painting in the sense that that's when painting was uh, participating in a kind of world historical revolution in human culture. Uh, anyway, that, that's that's a that's just a sort of passing thought about it. Uh, but so so what I, and what I want to show then from those painters was that they are doing what he says. They are putting on display. Um, a kind of a phenomenologically truer vision of vision than the theories of vision you're getting from, you know, Alberti or or Descartes. So that that's 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 grappling with those things that are happening in section three when he's talking in about Descartes, and actually in section two, which is where he introduces that notion of the figured history of vision and so on, and where he first talks about the way that vision is not separated from motion and those things. So those remarks I was just making uh, should pretty strongly resonate with things you would read in sections two and section three. Uh, in section four, now that he's made that point that we've just made, he goes on then to say, okay, let's look at painting. Uh, and he begins by saying, yeah, painting, um, it's amazing for dealing with depth and so on. Uh, anyway, he brings out three things. He, bring, he brings out depth, color, and line as three, three things that painting is really exploring and working with. And I wanted to just talk about those things a little bit too. Again, you know, what, what do you, what is it that you see when you see? You know, if you go back to those pictures like that deposition, um, or if you just go back to the way I was talking before, I mean, you basically see the world, which means you see things in space. There, there are things there in space, but you see them. And so it's like th things or bodies in a context that is illuminated. And that's more or less the three things he's going to bring out there. Depth, which is the sort of spatial context. Um, he's going to talk about color and maybe a little bit about illumination. Um, but but they're they're basically the same. Color is the way light appears, right? So things are illuminated, but you don't see light. You see stuff by the the way it is illuminated. And so the colors of things, in a way, reveal the illumination. And then those things themselves are formed and figured. And that's what he's going to more or less get at with line. So so these three dimensions, depth color or illumination and line or or form uh, it seems to me are are, tr are trying to explore uh, in, in a way those are three dimensions you might normally think of you know uh, depth width and height or something like that as the three dimensions of space but that's a very sort of prosaic model of space that's the kind of Albertian conception of space and he's in a way giving you a different three dimensions he's saying yeah depth Depth isn't just one of those three mathematical things. Depth is the amazing phenomenon of the there. There is. There's an outside. Like that's that's the thing that's crazy. So so there's depth, there is illumination, and there's form or figuring. Those those are in a way phenomenologically the things that are happening in your experience of reality. Uh, uh, each of which is irreducible to the others. And all of which are immediately given to you in your visual life. And so painting, he's saying, is, is really exploring those um, elementary dimensions of visual experience. Um, and so, uh, uh, yeah, so I want to talk about those three. So I want to just um, 
think a little bit about depth and uh, let's just look at some of that figured philosophy of vision and let's let's look at depth this is a fairly recent one this is a uh, the great uh, German artist Anselm Kiefer <clears throat> there's a painting called Albert, uh, sorry forest path for uh, Adelbert Stifter and you know it's, it's forest path like you can really see the depth there um, and the point really I want to make is is just that that you can see it one of the things about Kiefer's work is that they consistently play with uh, that sort of Albertian uh, model of the lines uh, moving towards a vanishing point and so on and that's that's always at the heart of his pictures and I've talked about that a little bit in um, Sites of Exposure. Now let's look at a couple of other ones. This is a, a work by George Gross. Um, it's a Berlin street scene from 1931 and you know again in, in a way if you sort of it, it's there's something kind of realistic about it but there's also something quite caricaturish about it and and the, my point about saying it's caricaturish is just to let you see that you see depth but you see it by means other than just that you know mathematical implantation of the albertian perspective these bodies sort of block e each other there's something quite essential about the way that you can't have uh, a, a positionless perspective and you know bodies uh, sort of jockey with each other for position in space. Anyway, I just wanted to look at that as, as a, a step further away from that straightforward Albertian thing. But then look at this. You know, there's a lot of depth in this one, uh, but the the whole way it's communicated is is different. The whole way this uh, work by by Van Gogh communicates is quite different from that sort of almost kind of mathematical realism you might uh, be more familiar with or, or one more here you know, look at this this self-portrait of Picasso on the one hand there's there's a way in which there's something quite manifestly flat about this like it keeps trying to sort of emphasize that you're looking at a flat thing and uh, that you're not looking at something that's sort of copying by those sort of mathematical rules the presentation of a three-dimensional object in a two-dimensional plane but what's what's remarkable about this is the incredible depth uh, the the incredible figuring of this of this uh, shaped body in space which beyond that also has a kind of profound inner depth so you, you, what you start to see here is how much the communicative power of the work is coming from something other than uh, the following of those mathematical rules. Um, so those, those were just a few things just to start uh, hinting a little bit at that perception of depth. Um, but now let's, let's look at the, the use of color. Here's a, a pretty obvious one. These are a uh, um, nice painting of the uh, Rouen Cathedral from uh, the 1890s, 1894, I think. This is, um, you know, the the thing. It's it's in the morning, and in a way, you know, so it it's it is portraying the light. It's it's showing you the light that lets you see the thing, and of course that is done by color. How else could it be done? But you know, you especially see that if you contrast that with this other picture from, uh, you know, noontime. Um, same uh, same part of it, uh, but it, in a different light. Um, so you can look at, at those two side by side, and there's a whole set of them that, that are, you know, of the same thing, but um, in different light. And so in, in a way, what those works put on display is the light, the illumination that lets there be the seeing of things. Right? Um, it's a little bit more. Uh, I have quite a bit of Picasso here because he's so amazing. Here, this is a uh, from 1905 um, uh, family of ac acrobats, and I mean with Picasso, you know, you could say so much about it. But but I what I did want to look at color here and light and, and to see how much is communicated by the use of color. 
showing you in a way how color lets something be seen. How color, or, you know, which is again illumination, lets the world be seen, lets bodies be seen. Um, you know, I, I look at um, the dress of the woman sitting in the front, uh, or the, um, the boy, I guess, with the sort of brown trunks on. Uh, it's, it's quite remarkable there how you can shift from the sort of uh, figured to the flat appearance uh, right at his edge, right? That, you know, you, you can sort of get into the picture of his body and you can see through that deployment of color uh, uh, a body. And yet you can also very quickly turn and see this is just a flat surface with paint on it by just moving to the sort of flat paint beside him. So the, the, this Picasso picture with that figure in particular seems to me almost to be showing you how he can bring a living figure out of the flat surface by showing you the flat surface as well. Um, and so you almost see the figure coming into being on the canvas and then with a special uh, depth when you get up to his face. Um, here's another one. This is from uh, a little bit later, 1921. But here I, I want you to really notice how much the that sort of sculptured body is being brought out by that deployment of color. And, and it's, it's amazing the effect that can be produced. So you almost are seeing things like they, they look like they're made out of, I don't know, carved pieces of wood or something like this. Um, but so he's, he's letting, he's making color do the work. And he's also letting you see how that deployment of color is what lets a body kind of appear before your eyes. And then the third one uh, Merleau-Ponty talks about is line. And uh, in, in the um, French publication of, of Eye and Mind, uh, Merleau-Ponty included a number of images which are not included in our translation, which is kind of embarrassing. Um, and I didn't bring all of them here, but I, I wanted to bring you this one. He includes this one, which is this um, Matisse drawing that I brought up before. And so the, th the interesting thing here is to see how the use of line lets a body appear. This, this you know, very um, elegantly shaped human body in, you know, in depth, in water, with long hair, in vegetation, like this thing comes through, through a few lines. And the lines uh, are, are not exactly reproducing f factual lines. It's not. It's not like um, like if you saw a photograph, you wouldn't see those lines. And and in certain respects, you might even think, oh, they're not. A, they're not entirely realistic. And yet, the lines are used so as to let something be seen. So you don't really see the lines. You see the figure. The lines um, kind of step back to let this amazing figure appear. Um, but here's another one from that same uh, uh, Picasso series of the Sultan Bank. Here, again, like I think if you look at these figures, you can see the, the amazing ability he has to put a simple line on paper and through that line to, al to allow an amazingly sophisticated and complex figure to appear. You know, a human world full of emotion and action and so on suddenly comes out to you through a, a few little lines he's drawn there. You know, and this this has the line and the color and, and everything working together. But I, I thought of this one as putting more on display the, the power of the line. Uh, and so Merleau-Ponty, one, one of the things Merleau-Ponty talks about in there, and there are a couple of places on uh, both uh, 182 and earlier on 180, he talks about uh, shedding the envelope, basically, of the thing. And, and the point he wants to make there is that um, whatever you're seeing, whatever is there, um, is itself the expression of some kind of force or power. And he's saying that what painting has, you know, in, in these kinds of works has realized is that it, it needs to uh, portray that power that lets appearing happen rather than trying to copy an appearance. 
And so it, it sort of, as he says, it sort of sheds the envelope uh, rather than trying to reproduce that sort of the, the finished surface. It tries on its own to put on display that formative power. And in doing that, those figures appear. Um, uh, and so he, you know, that, and that's where he distinguishes um, quoting a work about da Vinci. I don't uh, know if the remark is da Vinci's or the writer's, but he distinguishes the flexuous line from the prosaic line, where the prosaic line would be the copy, but the flexuous line would be the line that gives birth to form. But the line, the, the, sort of the way Derrida talks about writing, the line that itself, in a way, recedes from your perception in order to let a figure appear. That's on around page 184. Uh, but the point is, in in all of these things, he's saying, what the what the painter, the artist, is really doing is exploring how appearance comes to be, and so what these people are seeing and hence showing in their work is basically how the world shows itself to us and they are that's what they're putting on display they're putting on display the showing of reality or something like that and so he that's that i think is why he says uh, uh, on page 188 that you, you can't really say where nature ends and where human or human expression begins right that when if you have this this sort of, just as you can have a kind of dualism of thought and space you can have a dualism of reality and our experience of it or reality and our portrayal of it but he's saying what what painting in a way challenges is exactly that kind of dualism and, and it's in a way saying saying that reality shows itself and it is it is in a sense to be experienced and so the activity of experiencing it and expressing it is not so much an alien act imposed upon it as a kind of continuation of its own motion and its own trajectory. And this that's something like that is that point he was getting at when he's talking about mirrors and so on. And I think, uh, I think that's 168 and maybe even before that, when he talks about the way, uh, you know, in the portrayal of mirrors, they're showing how things effectively showing themselves to other things or being seen by other things is in a way prefigured in everything. And that the human being and the artistic gesture as, as the exemplary version of that is in a way carrying to its culmination that defining relationship, or I should say that relationship that, it, that in an essential way defines what it is to be. Right, so that to show, to appear, is not at odds with what it means to be, but is in a way integral of what it is to be. And so that's that's a that's more or less where I want to leave it. You know, this hasn't been a, a thorough investigation of this essay. Uh, I've been I've tried to give you really an introduction to it, to try to bring out some of the provocative, but but also quite powerful uh, ideas uh, contained in it, uh, and. Um, you know, that core idea is that the artwork is in a way the thing that uh, starts to allow us to make sense of our own experience. And in, so in that sense, uh, the art, artistic expression is prior to the familiar structures of language and conceptualization that that we rely on and that that we don't even notice as having come from somewhere uh, and then for that same reason artistic work can also uh, allow us to challenge the uh, familiar habits we have for interpreting our experience that has come through those things and the particular thing that he's doing here then is is showing how in painting the phenomenological critique he's giving of that representational model of experience is in fact uh, figured or i guess we could say prefigured in painting and then he uh, pursues that uh, reflection on painting to see more what it shows instead to be the nature of vision and in focusing on and putting and, and in 
putting on display, in making visible the way that vision makes visible, it's really showing how it is something in the nature of being to appear. And that is why then, that's a further reason why we can't really operate with this radical dualism of subjectivity and objectivity, that to appear, to be experienced is something in the very meaning of what it is to be. And therefore, our own experience of reality, and especially our attempts to express that, are, uh, can't really be construed just as some alien secondary, some alien or other thing that's happening to reality, but has to be understood as integral to the very um, uh, life or trajectory of, of, uh, of, re of being itself, of reality itself. So I'll leave that there. Um, I hope that allows you to read the essay, to make some sense of the essay, and allow you to see a little bit of the continuity of what he's doing with the whole thing we've been doing in phenomenology so far and especially to start to open some doors into thinking about philosophically about the nature of art and its uh, relevance to to our own experience